And I'll be with Hitachi High Tech Analytical Science, which today is all about electronics coatings and how you get the accuracy and precision you need at a submicron level. My name is Clive Coldwell. I'm group editor of Electronics Weekly. And to present and discuss the issue, I'd like to introduce Matt Kreiner, who is Hitachi High Tech Analytical Sciences product manager for its coatings analysis product line. Hello, Matt. Hello, Clive. Just a quick intro to you. Uh, Matt's got 18 years of experience working with XRF technology, starting his career as an applications engineer, and he's held many different roles within Hitachi. He lives in Chicago. It's very good to have him here today. And he holds a BSc in chemical engineering from Northwestern University. Um, the sort of general pit points today, um, Matt will give us a brief introduction to X-ray fluorescence or XRF, which is the, as you probably know, the established method for verifying the composition and thickness of coatings on electronics devices. XRF applications in the semiconductor and electronics industry, and what you should do to make XRF analysis easier and more productive. But quickly before we start, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. Firstly, um, today's webinar will be available on demand after the live session, and it's accessible through the same link you're using now. However, we'd love to hear from you today. And if you have a question for for Matt, please feel free to send it through the Ask a Question tab at the bottom of the page, and we'll be holding uh, a Q&A at the end of the session, so keep those questions coming in. If we don't get your question today, don't worry, we'll be sure to follow up afterwards. Uh, and finally, we'd, we'd encourage you to share today's webinar with your social networks. And just one other thing, towards the end of a session before we log off, we're going to run a poll uh, so uh, don't run away before you've had a look at that and, and tell us what you think. That would be absolutely marvellous. So without any further ado, let's kick things off. Over to you, Matt. Great. Thank you, Clive. Let me get the slides up. All right. Great. So uh, thanks to everyone joining us today as we review the latest advances in XRF technology for measuring coatings on semiconductors and microelectronics. If you are considering buying your first XRF, or if you've owned the same equipment for uh, many years and are interested in knowing what you could get from the latest generation analyzers, I hope this presentation will be informative and give you something to think about. Our agenda is fairly short today. I will start with a brief introduction to XRF. We'll review some applications of XRF in the semiconductor and electronics industry and then introduce some ways to make your measurements easier and more productive. Okay, let's start with how an XRF coatings analyzer works, what it can do, and what components you'll find in every instrument. X-ray fluorescence, or XRF, is an atomic emission technique for elemental analysis. A beam of primary X-rays is directed at a part being measured. If the X-rays collide with electrons with enough energy, the electrons are ejected from their orbits. This leaves a vacancy, making the atom unstable. So an electron from a higher energy state spontaneously drops down to fill this vacancy. When the electron makes this transition, it goes from high energy to low energy and emits an X-ray that has energy that is characteristic both to the element and to the specific transition. This is happening to every element in the apart simultaneously, and this is where the detector steps in. The detector's job is to collect the fluoresced x-rays, separate them into discrete energy range buckets, and count them. This can be presented to the user as a spectrum like the image on the bottom left of the screen. This plot shows intensity, or number of x-rays counted by the detector, as a function of energy. The energy scale tells us which elements are present, and the intensity indicates how much of each element is present, either as thickness or as composition. Since we're interested in getting a thickness or composition value, not just a plot, the instrument converts the spectrum into a quantified value in one of two ways. The software either uses an empirical calibration derived from measuring a series of standards and plotting a regression, or it uses a mathematical model called fundamental parameters, which is a well-studied series of equations that relates intensities to thickness or composition by first principles. There are reasons to use either calibration mode, but each can give you excellent results. XRF is versatile not only for the range of elements that it can measure, typically aluminum through uranium, but also the thickness range it can quantify for those coatings. 
With XRF coatings analyzers, you can measure down to the nanometer scale or as thick as tens of microns or several mils. The thickness range for an XRF is highly dependent on the element being measured, the order of the layers, and the substrate material. Let's start by considering how thick you can measure. Generally speaking, as you move up the periodic table, the higher the energy of the strongest XRF line for that element becomes. This is important because the higher the energy, the easier it is for that signal to leave the plating and get to the detector. There is a limitation to the power of the X-ray tube, so at some point we can no longer generate an XRF signal for the strongest line, and we need to use the next line in the series. You can see where that happens in this plot. Once you get past tin, we need to switch from the K lines to the L lines. In addition to the energy of the lines, the density of the plating has a significant effect on the feasible thickness range. The maximum thickness shown here is the amount through which secondary X-rays for a given element can escape a layer of that element. As for how thin an XRF can measure, this has more to do with the amount of X-ray signal that reaches the surface of your part and the characteristics of the detector than it does on the element itself. It is also affected by the geometry between the X-ray tube, sample, and detector, and the measurement time. For most platings and coatings, we are safely in the comfortable range of an XRF's capability. This is a visual representation of the XRF sensitivity for common application, ANYPEG, or electroless nickel, electroless palladium immersion gold. Gold is the blue line on the left, palladium is the green line on the right, and nickel is the purple line in the middle. You can clearly see the effect of an element's density and its X-ray strength in this plot. Palladium is efficiently excited and has sensitivity to about 40 micron. For gold, where we need to use the secondary L lines because the X-ray tube doesn't have enough energy to fluoresce the stronger K lines, we see sensitivity to approximately 5 micron, almost an order of magnitude less than palladium. The curve starts to level off as we approach saturation thickness. Now let's look at the internals of an XRF that has been purpose-built for coatings analysis. All XRFs will have some similar components. There is an X-ray tube that generates the primary X-rays that are directed at your parts. The opening from the tube is typically larger than the parts or features you want to measure, so there is an aperture that reduces the beam diameter. There's a camera to help you locate the area you want to measure, and the detector is what converts the fluorescence signal into thickness and composition results. With XRF, the geometry between the X-ray tube, sample, and detector is important, as X-rays lose intensity exponentially with distance, so it is critical that the calculations account for this. All XRFs have a way to maintain a consistent geometry, and that's through a process called focusing. In this diagram, this is shown as a laser focus. It doesn't matter which coatings XRF you consider, they will all have these components, and they will help you get great results. Let's consider the aperture that reduces the size of the X-ray beam and directs it toward your parts. There are two ways this is done. The most common way is by using a collimator. This is a metal block that has a hole drilled precisely through it. This is effective, but a substantial amount of the signal from the X-ray tube doesn't reach the part, and there is a practical limit as to how small the hole can be drilled. The more advanced capillary technique uses a focusing optic. Polycapillary optics are a significant improvement over traditional mechanically collimated systems. Rather than blocking a portion of the X-ray tube signal and allowing only a small fraction of the signal to reach the part being measured, polycapillary optic collects almost all of the signal leaving the X-ray tube and focuses it to a small area using a series of specialized curved glass tubes. The result of this is much higher count rate directed at the part which provides faster analysis and better precision when measuring thinner coatings on smaller features. So how small of a feature can we measure? Let's look at the two ways that polycapillary optics beam diameter can be described. In the image on the right, you see two spot sizes for the same optic. The smaller number, typically used in marketing documents, is the width of an intensity plot at half of the maximum intensity, also known as FWHM, or full width at half maximum. The larger number is a little more practical in explaining the feature size that is realistic for the analyzer. This number describes the beam size that captures 90% of the intensity leaving the optic. It is good practice to leave some safety margin to cover as much of the beam as possible. 
With the energy distribution from polycapillary optics, it can sometimes be difficult to identify a hard boundary where the X-ray spot ends. This is due to something called the halo effect, which is presented in the image on the bottom left. To demonstrate it, we'll look at a series of five holes drilled through a piece of copper and have the optic scan through the center axis of all five holes with the intensity plotted below it. In older style optics, as shown in the orange plot, the halo effect was much more pronounced. You can see that the intensity doesn't get to zero, indicating that some of the X-ray beam is interacting with the copper, and the shoulders between the copper plate and the holes are quite broad. With newer generation optics, as shown in the darker plot, the intensity does get to zero and the walls of the holes are much more pronounced. This gives you more confidence in your spot size and allows you to measure smaller components or components with smaller pitch. That covers the excitation side of an XRF. Now let's look at the detector. This is an important decision you need to make, and it's a bit complicated. There are two main kinds of detectors in a coatings analyzer, a gas-filled proportional counter, as shown on the left, and a high-resolution semiconductor detector, as shown on the right, in this case, a silicon drift detector, or SDD. Proportional counters were the detectors used in the earliest coatings analyzers, and they are still very popular today. They're very effective for simple plating stacks and offer advantages over the newer style semiconductor detectors. Namely, they have high count rates when using very small collimators and sometimes offer improved sensitivity for high energy elements like tin or silver. SDDs, on the other hand, have a significant advantage in resolution. In XRF, detector resolution is similar to resolution in a television. The better the resolution, the better its ability to see fine details. In the comparison at the top of the screen, you see two spectra from the same sample, a piece of steel plated with zinc nickel. With the green spectrum from a proportional counter, you can clearly see the zinc peak and the iron peak, but the nickel is less obvious. Software and spectral deconvolution makes it possible to get good results with a proportional counter. However, the red spectrum from the SDD shows clean peaks for zinc, nickel, and iron, even showing some of the secondary lines for those elements. It also has a lower background in between those peaks. This isn't necessary for every application, but it is useful when there are many elements in the sample or when the coatings are very thin. Because of the improved sensitivity of an SDD, it is also possible to extend the analytical range of the XRF to include phosphorus, allowing you to measure thickness and composition of electroless nickel, amongst other things. On top of that, these detectors tend to be more stable than proportional counters. The gas in proportional counters is affected more by changes to temperature, pressure, and humidity in your facility. That can be accounted for, but it's another step and is a consideration in this decision. In some cases, it isn't going to be obvious which detector is more appropriate for all of your requirements. Good XRF manufacturers are willing to work with you and help you make an informed decision. Now that we have a basic understanding of the technology, let's put it to use and look at some applications. Let's start by looking at performance data for electroless nickel. The table on the top shows data for electroless nickel on copper, with great precision for both thickness and composition. The table on the bottom shows electroless nickel performance measuring through a gold layer that's 90 nanometers thick. This naturally isn't as good as when gold isn't present, but the performance is still excellent and allows inspection of finished goods or incoming materials. This analysis is made possible by the combination of higher count rates from polycapillary optics and improved sensitivity of high resolution SDD detectors. The plot on the right gives you an idea of how far XRF manufacturers can push this capability. It is a plot of the transmission efficiency of phosphorus through a gold layer. As gold gets thicker, less phosphorus signal reaches the detector. At 1000 nanometers or one micron of gold, Approximately only 10% of the phosphorus signal can escape the gold layer. You can imagine at that point the precision has degraded significantly. Next is the gold plating itself, sometimes measured to understand under bump metallurgy. You can see gold applied to a number of plating stacks in the nanometer and angstrom range. At short measurement times and at these thin levels, an XRF with polycapillary optics provides relative precision of about 1%, which is really quite impressive. Looking at some lighter metals now with aluminum and titanium on silicon wafers. 
We expect that performance of, of aluminum will not be as good as it is for heavier metals because aluminum doesn't travel well through air. But this demonstrates the power of polycapillary optics. The optics are able to direct enough signal to the wafer that we're still able to get 2% relative standard deviation at 30 seconds. If you're wondering why the table says 30 seconds times 2, this is because this measurement requires two conditions, one for aluminum and one for gold and chrome. I like this next example because it shows the effect that a plating stack can have on precision. We start by looking at single layer applications of chrome and rhodium on radio frequency or microwave filters, and then compare the performance when they're plated on top of each other. In either order, the chrome layer has little effect on the precision of the high energy element, rhodium or ruthenium, but the heavier element causes the chrome precision to degrade. This is just a reminder that there are many situations that affect performance, so we need to understand customers' requirements and perform thorough testing to accurately demonstrate the instrument's capabilities. This data demonstrates the value of XRF and quality control. The data on the bottom is a static precision study showing what the instrument is capable of under ideal conditions. Above that are the results from measuring five pads on the same part. When we compare the data, we see that the analyzer has better precision than the plating line. Combining these two statistics gives the user an idea of how to set the lower and upper control limits for the XRF and still ensure that their parts will be in specification. Okay. XRF coatings analyzers are great for quality control and production control for plating lines. Here are some ways they are designed to improve your testing efficiency. Handling semiconductor wafers is a delicate task. Loading wafers into an XRF can be an additional challenge. You do not want to drop the wafer onto the sample stage, and you don't want to damage it while trying to position it in the right orientation. Some XRFs offer a wafer handling stage that can make it easier, faster, and safer to load parts into the instrument. The jig is built to securely support standard wafer sizes ranging from about 4 to 12 inches. The jig has interchangeable components to allow you to quickly and easily switch between wafer sizes by simply replacing a top plate that sits on the stage. There are padded supports, supports positioned under the wafer to keep it flat and protect them from hitting the steel frame. And there is a path for wafer tweezers to access the jig to provide secure loading and unloading. The features being measured are very small and are difficult to see with the naked eye. XRF instruments have a high definition camera that provides a clear image of the part and its features. From the camera view, it is possible to magnify the image up to 16 times so the user can position their parts precisely where they need to be. There are software controls for the camera and for zooming. And in some cases, you can also zoom by using the mouse scroll wheel, which I find to be more convenient. Being able to find the features to be measured is important, but so is the ability to make out patterns and textures to be sure the right area is targeted for analysis. In this example, we're looking at solder bumps. The image on the left shows the lighting from an instrument where the lighting source is set off at an angle. You will notice that the brightest part of the solder bumps isn't exactly the top of the bumps, which is what you would expect to see. The directionality of the light source makes it tempting to position the bumps in the wrong place, which may affect your results. The second image shows improved annular or ring lighting, which eliminates the effect by shining a uniform light across the surface of the bumps. This addresses one issue, but leaves the sample a little dark and difficult to navigate. By combining the ring lighting with a light source that is coaxial to the x-ray tube, the sample view is greatly improved, the desired measurement locations are easy to find, and the curvature of the bumps is no longer an issue. Here's another example of how this combination of annular and coaxial lighting improves sample visibility, this time looking at pattern on a wafer. With just annular lighting, you can see the tracks, but some of the surface details are lost in the contrast. With just coaxial lighting, there's better contrast, but the textures are a little difficult to read. But combining the two light sources gives the best of both worlds. You get a clear view of the pattern and texture, and it is much easier to target the exact location you want to measure. 
As mentioned earlier, the distance from the x-ray tube to the sample to the detector is critical for XRF results, in part because x-ray signal decreases exponentially with distance. If the distance is shorter than expected, the plating appears to be too thick. If the distance is longer than expected, the plating appears too thin. All XRF instruments have ways to ensure you get good results. One of these ways is to shine a fine laser onto the surface of the part. When preparing the measurement, the operator moves the tube and detector up or down until the light from the laser is positioned across the focus line. This is a simple approach that is very effective, but does require the operator to make some decisions. Some instruments have a way to automate focusing. With a feature called Auto Approach, the desired focal distance is selected during calibration. When the operator measures a part, they position the part under the x-ray tube and click to start auto approach. The instrument uses a sensor to measure the distance to the part and automatically drives the analysis head up or down into the right position. This is quick and reproducible and removes decisions from the operator's task. Another focusing method doesn't require the analysis head to move at all. In this case, autofocus measures the distance from the tube to the part to the detector and simply updates the calibration and calculations to account for the new geometry. The operator does not need to make any decisions and actually doesn't need to take any action at all other than to position the part in the right place. Autofocus or distance independent measurement has a working range that depends on the manufacturer and allows you to measure parts of different shapes and sizes. To demonstrate the advantage of these automated methods, we conducted a quick test. Six parts of different heights were put on the sample stage and the user was asked to create a multi-point program to measure all six parts. This was done using a focus laser and then again with auto approach and auto focus. Since the actual measurement times are identical, we only considered the setup time for this program. With the focus laser, it took 44 seconds to set up the program. With auto approach, it took 29 seconds, which is 15 seconds or 33% faster. With auto focus, the setup took 17 seconds, which is 27 seconds or 62% faster. I know that 15 or 27 seconds may not sound like a lot of time, but if this task is performed 50 times a day, which is not a lot for many facilities, the operator can save 12 to 22 minutes each day, which can be spent performing other tasks. Over the course of a year, that adds up to 40 to 76 hours in time savings. Imagine what can be done with an extra one to two weeks of productivity every year. Now that you've saved some time in your measurement setup, what can you do with it? It would be completely justifiable and valuable to just bank those savings and have your operators use that time to perform other tasks. But you could also invest that time to reduce your operating costs. We all know that time is money. You may not know that XRF results are closely related to time. In any XRF, a critical part of the analysis, precision or standard deviation, is affected by measurement time. The longer you measure, the more signal is collected by the detector and the better the precision becomes. This is a predictable relationship. When you increase the measurement time by a factor of four, the standard deviation is reduced, reduced or improved by half. I presented an example of this in the table on the right. A typical XRF measurement time is about 20 seconds. For the sake of discussion, let's assume that at 20 seconds, your XRF's precision is 10 nanometers. That means your XRF has a 99% confidence interval of plus or minus 30 nanometers. If you increase the measurement time by a factor of four to 80 seconds, the standard deviation drops by half to five nanometers. Conversely, if you decrease your measurement time by a factor of four, the standard deviation increases by a factor of two to 20 nanometers. The confidence interval shrinks or expands accordingly. When you determine where to operate your plating line, this statistical error is taken into account. Let's look at an example of using 20 second measurement time with a lower control limit at 200 nanometers. In this case, you would say a result passes if it is above 200 nanometers plus 30 nanometers, the standard deviation at a 99% confidence interval at this measurement time. That puts your XRF limit at 230 nanometers. But you just saved some time using advanced setup configurations so you can take longer measurements. If you instead take 80 second measurements, your XRF control limit 
can drop to 200 nanometers plus 15 nanometers. My math is correct, that's 215 nanometers, which could save you 7% on material costs. That adds up very quickly, especially when working with expensive metals. On the other hand, if you have a large specification range and you're not operating near the limits, you can do the opposite of this. Reduce your measurement time, accept the larger variations, and either free up your operators to tackle another problem or free up the XRF for measuring parts from another line. Either way, this is something you have complete control over. And just a recommendation, every XRF has a minimum allowable measurement time, so check with the ma manufacturer for recommendations on that end. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there is a practical limit to how long you would want to measure, where the gain in precision is outweighed by the load on the instrument. Now let's make it easier for operators to get parts into the right position. This can be difficult and is usually the longest step in a measurement. XRF chambers are fairly large, parts have complex geometries, and the measurement areas are very small. The camera view is similar to a microscope, magnifying the image to show as much detail as possible. You can get a clear view, but it still takes time for the operator to get into the right area on the part and then pinpoint the exact location where the measurement needs to happen. One way to simplify this is to use image processing software for routine parts. For routine parts like this circuit board, you teach the software to recognize a pattern that is visible in the sample image. You don't need to measure the pattern itself, but this creates the reference for the software. After you select the pattern, you select the exact measurement location. In this case, the pattern is the grid of circular pads shown on the top, and the measurement area is dead center on the bottom right pad shown in the bottom image. When it's time to measure, the operator just needs to get the grid into the image view and the software automatically moves to the center of the bottom right pad. The operator doesn't need to pick out the right pad and doesn't need to find the center of that pad. This is much easier, can be faster, and ensures the correct area is measured every time. Sometimes the XRF results are used for quick go-no-go -no -go decisions for quality or production control. In other cases, full reports are necessary, either for internal purposes or to be sent to customers. From the results screen in the controlling software, you can create different kinds of reports, data and customer reports. The data output format on the left side of the monitor has just rows of data, good for linking to a quality system or copying into another report. The customer report on the right is a more comprehensive printout, including measurements, statistics, trends, and sample images. All measurements are stored in a database that can be accessed by opening the data viewer from the routine analysis screen. You can search for data based on date range or lot information and show the raw data or trends. You can print a report from the data viewer by right-clicking in the results list. For advanced users who want to investigate raw data and are looking for more information than what is shown in the routine measurement screen, they can switch to a comprehensive qualitative or spectrum investigation tool. Let's say something's gone wrong in your process and you aren't achieving your control limits. What this tool allows you to do is take a measurement with or without thickness results, identify peaks, and get raw data. Some of these tools allow you to position a cursor over the spectrum and the software tells you what element may be present there. Others automatically label all the peaks. In many cases, you can also compare spectrum. So you can load a spectrum from a part you know is good and compare that to one that's out of spec and figure out what's different. This particular tool allows you to compare the spectra on the same plot or stack them on top of each other. It also has a feature where you can subtract two spectra from each other and just see the differences. That's the ultimate in spectral comparison. Under or overplating becomes more apparent Whatever is only present in one sample or missing from another will show up immediately, and peaks that may be buried in noise may become more visible. Qualitative mode is a really useful tool. You don't have to be an XRF expert to master it, and it can help you quickly identify common problems like the wrong base metal was plated, a strike layer was skipped, or that there's a contaminant in some layer. This is also a valuable tool when you start working with new materials. Are they what you expected? When you're providing technical support to your customers, they can send you a part they're concerned about, and you can perform an evaluation. 
And not to give you any ideas, but this is also valuable for investigating unknown materials, including and performing competitive analysis. Okay, let's wrap this up. XRF is a great tool from the semiconductor and electronics industry to test incoming materials, control production, and verify finished goods. With a basic XRF, you will get good, reliable results. With an advanced XRF using latest generation polycapillary optics, high resolution detectors, and sophisticated software, you can get better precision and higher throughput, reduce costs from chemical consumption, and future-proof your lab for the eventuality that components get smaller or control limits become tighter. Keep in mind that the average XRF is kept in service for approximately seven to 10 years, with many in use for much longer than that. Investing a bit more upfront gives you more time to take advantage of their benefits and maximize the savings over the course of the XRF's lifetime. Okay. Thank you for joining the webinar today. Hope you found it informative. If you have any questions now, please send them through the questions panel. If you think of something later, feel free to contact me through the email address shown here or connect with me on LinkedIn. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, the, the two or three actually uh, certainly come to mind. The questions actually for, for the moment, anyway. Um, can these kinds of XRF instruments be automated? Is that an obvious question? Uh, it's not. It, it, it's know. not. It's not always obvious. I'll say that's the the growing trend in the industry is to to look for these instruments to get as close to the production line as possible. Um, the, the XRF has uh, safety interlocks to to protect the operators who are working near them. Uh, that's something you can work with um, XRF manufacturers to figure out. Uh, most of the time, if you're looking for automation, you're you're really talking about getting parts in and out of the instrument. Okay, that's not something that's integral to the XRF, but it can be built in uh, through a, an automation company. And then you're looking at um, triggering a result. Again, that that's something that can be done through software controls and uh, data handling, which can be set to be uh, automated as well. So there's there's an awful lot you can do with automation. Um, if you're talking about putting it directly in process, you're, you're talking uh, potentially an order of magnitude change in the cost, but uh, there are some possibilities there. Must be huge benefits, I would have thought there, actually. I'm enormous. Um, another thing, another question here, actually, do X-ray instruments have any special radiation safety handling yeah i mean it, so it is a it's an x-ray generating device um so it's not as severe as some uh, higher power equipment um it, it's not like uh, getting a medical or dental x-ray where uh, the technician or the doctor is going to run out of the room before they start taking a measurement but these uh these benchtop xrf in particular they have a lot of uh, safety protection features including like i mentioned uh, safety interlocks uh, some of these are completely enclosed sample chambers um, so again, designed to, to prevent extra uh, leakage radiation. Uh, some of these instruments have slotted chambers, uh, but again, they're designed so that the, uh, the leakage radiation is kept to a minimum. Uh, the requirements in specific regions, states, countries, uh, is going to vary. So you're gonna check with your local radiation um, officers and, and authorities. But for the most part, th these are designed to be safe. They meet uh, uh, quite a few uh, radiation and uh, EMC compliance requirements. Uh, that, that's uh, very stringent and Hitachi holds herself to even higher standards than those. Okay, uh, third question coming in. Can I use an XRF to detect contaminants on the surface of, of the wafer? Yeah, I'll say that there's uh, there's a couple of possibilities there. Um, the, the limitation is you're talking about a very small spot size with a capillary optic, that's great. But some of these contaminants can be even smaller than that. So if you're talking about uh, contaminants that are on the order of uh, one micron or a couple of microns, hitting it with a 30 micron beam or a 10 micron beam, uh, you might miss some of them. So you have some spatial resolution issues. Um, but if you if you hit on a contaminant, I mean, it's XRF. If it's a metallic uh, contamination, then we'll see it. If you're concerned about things like oils and greases, th those are elements that XRF does not particularly pick up very easily, especially not these coatings instruments. So it's not going to get those, but uh, with, with metal contaminants, uh, definitely a, a possibility. Are there any other sort of important points that you, um, you've you made this this afternoon? I almost lost track of morning afternoon there. Uh, that you think really people should have as a takeaway from your from your session today? I think the, the takeaways are that we all know that electronics are getting smaller. We know that some of these uh, coatings are getting thinner. Um, looking at 
devices with uh, with advanced capillary optics um, it certainly helps to, to future proof purchases. Um, and like I said before, the ability to measure with better precision, it, it's a nice thing because you understand what's happening in your process, but there are real cost savings that can be uh, realized uh, by controlling your process as close to your limits as you want, which is the goal of most production facilities. So, um, you know, if you're in the market right now, maybe buy a little bit more than you need. If you have an old instrument, looking at uh, at something with more capability could end up being a, a, a fairly strong return on investment for you. Fantastic. Well, it's pretty comprehensive, I'd have to say. Um, well, talking to everybody, if you've got questions, do send them in. Um, we'll probably answer them after the session now, I think. But uh, there is a poll we'd love you to uh, take part in, if you could, before you leave. Uh, that would help us enormously. I think... Um, uh, it's got a three. How old is your RF, R, XRF coatings analyzer? Are you planning purchasing and so on? Um, to get answers to those questions, would be absolutely marvelous if you could before you leave. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Matt for presenting to us. That's a really clear, comprehensive, I must admit. And if you haven't managed to get through, as I say, rest assured, we'll get back to you. So goodbye to everybody, and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.